different? Well, I got involved as a student at Howard University. Um, I came to Howard University in 1960 and found Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, is one of the most segregated places in the country. Uh, the housing was segregated in Washington, D.C. The, the, the Redskins, the football team for Washington had no black players. Uh, public accommodations were segregated. No black people could drive and uh, drive buses because the guy Oro Chalk said that black people would steal the money. Uh, so almost every aspect of life in Washington was segregated. In addition to that, if you wanted to travel between Washington and New York on Route 40, because they didn't have uh, 95 at that point, they had Route 40, uh, the, the public accommodations were, were um, segregated. And if you went to Baltimore or any of the places surrounding. So basically I got involved because I found myself in a very segregated environment which I did not want to tolerate. And you joined the Nonviolent Action Group. Yes, the Nonviolent Action Group was a, a group that was the SNCC group at Howard. Uh, SNCC was once at the beginning, actually, as the name says, a coordinating committee of student groups. So you had groups here in, in Washington, you had groups in Atlanta, you had groups in, in, uh, in Maryland, in Baltimore, you had groups you know, across the country. So basically I was one of the people who belonged to the Nonviolent Action Group, which was the SNCC group in Washington at Howard University. Howard group was SNCC. Okay. I mean, because SNCC and, I mean, basically you had chapters, a SNCC chapter, I mean, basically they were SNCC. SNCC evolved to be something different in 1962. But in 1960, when I joined, basically you had the civic interest group in Baltimore, you had the, you know, the group here, you had the group in, in, uh, say groups in Tennessee, groups in Georgia and so forth, and combined they were SNCC. They, it was mostly just students, not, they were not field secretaries. They were just, our approach was much more political. We were much more, we, the national group, really John Lewis, Diane Nash and so forth, really believe in the question of nonviolence because they, uh, were, were highly influenced by, um, by, by the teachings of Gandhi and others. Uh, and they believed that you could appeal to men's hearts and that, you, you know, that basically they wanted to form the beloved community. Uh, the Howard group, our group, felt that we were faced with a political situation that was untenable for us uh, and that you know, we, we knew we had to um, embrace nonviolence, but it was not because we believed in the, the beloved community, is that they had too many guns. And therefore, <laughs> we needed to figure out ways that we could move the discussion uh, because uh, appealing to men's hearts and getting them to change their mind so that we could have a better situation was never going to happen. Was there a tension between, and, and a tension, I don't mean a, like an angry tension, but a philosophical tension between students who were coming out of the South versus students who were coming out of the North? Was there a difference in the way? I wouldn't that say that. I would say there was a difference, philosophical difference, between people who were dominated, who came out of Nashville, uh, and I would say ultimately a Southwest Georgia. Uh, than people who were coming out of Howard University and, and other places. But I think the two big poles in the organization, the uh, Nashville group and then the, the NAG group. Uh, 
I was a member of the coordinating council and the executive committee of SNCC when it was a student organization. And uh, was your first acquaintance with him at the April meeting? Did you guys, did you attend the April 1960 meeting or did your acquaintance? I came, I came, I came later. I okay. mean, I was not, I was not in the April 1960, no, I came later. Yeah, my understanding is you began in the fall of 1960. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So when you, when did you first meet Julian? I, frankly, <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. I mean, my, my, I, I cannot remember when I first met Julian. I mean, I mean, I, I probably know where I met him was probably eight and a half Raymond Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know he probably was sitting down smoking a cigarette uh, but, uh, and at a typewriter, but I cannot tell you when I, I met, met Julian. Okay. Uh, do you have a, do you recall a first impression of him? Uh, what his role was in SNCC, what his role was in the early stages of the movement? Yeah, I mean, Julian was the communicator. Um, he was the person who understood, um, you know, what the organization, I mean, he was the person facing out. He mm -hmm. was the person delivering the message uh, out. And that particularly was, that was particularly important because it meant, you know, our lives, uh, were you know a little bit safer because things were not done in the dark. There was some sense that other people knew what was going on. So, I mean, I think his ability to communicate, and and at this point, I'm talking about writing, not in terms of you know his voice and, and television and things that came later on, but his ability to communicate clearly and quickly. Uh, was very important to the uh, the lives of many of the students who were at that point engaged in uh, demonstrations. They were, I mean, so the early days, SNCC dealt mostly with sit-ins and and uh, freedom rides, so that uh, we're really talking about things that centered around public accommodations. I don't think that level of sophistication existed. We were trying, I think, trying to stay alive. Uh, we were trying to, to, I mean, I think, you know, for, for I would say, well, it's 50-50. I would say for the, uh, for the national people and, you know, John Lewis and Diane and so forth, the, the ability to communicate to the world uh, what was going on and so forth was particularly important. I think, I must say that people like Claude sitting at the New York Times, um, Nelson, I believe, um, I forgot his first Jack name, Nelson. Jack Nelson, uh, uh, the, the advent of television and, and the ability for people to see what was going on was extremely important because basically it became a national issue and people had to see it. The other thing that was important uh, at that time, when we were very conscious of this, was that you had the newly independent states in Africa coming to being and the question of the Cold War, that is to say, you know, at the, the, you know who, which states which, which side would be able to re relate to Africa favorably. Um, and that one of the reasons that the, the Kennedy people wanted to desegregate uh, Route 40 and so forth, because it was embarrassing the United States that African diplomats who were traveling between Washington and New York, or New York and Washington, were discriminated against. So basically you had a, 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 an environment, a, a public environment, where you had at one layer the, the, the beginnings of television in terms of becoming a mass medium. You had uh, really good print reporters like Claude Sitton, Jack Nelson, and then you had the, the international discussion 
uh, where uh, at the end of the day, whatever happened in the United States was reflected at the United Nations and Africa and Asia. So therefore, while we did not consciously go after trying to develop a strategy to deal with the times or deal with the posts, the, the communications environment was so dynamic that engaging in it allowed us to do a number of things that probably we could not have done if we tried to consciously construct something that was in some that was non-dynamic. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about, just because of what you've said, was the concept of developing a communications department. Right. And that's one thing that a lot of people either don't talk about or don't read about when they talk about the early period of the movement. Was that a conscious decision? Did yes. folks come together and say, okay, well, we have all these things we want to do, but we need to communicate this message? Oh, yes. How did that work? Yes. I mean, one of the things that you have to realize, right? So I'm, I'm in 1960, I'm 19 years old. Julian might have been 20, 21 at bet most. I mean, if you were 26 years old, you were considered old. I mean, like Bob Moses and Jim Foreman was ancient. I mean, so you're really dealing with young people who were somewhere between 17 and 22 years old. I mean, so you have to deal, understand that. So we not only established a community, we not only had the student voice, which uh, we had a photography department. We also had a printing press we created when we moved to the new building we had a printing press that printed its own materials so we were very conscious that we needed to organize we also had which was very important i mean in the age of today people would laugh young people would laugh but we had the watts line which was wide area tele telephone service which was i mean a lifeline to us and that was not only cheaper, but allowed us to communicate with the world. I mean, it, it was the Twitter of its time. I mean, you know, that the ability to reach anybody anywhere. I mean, so we, were, we had the Watts line, which was new technology. We had, you know, uh, the student voice, which was our own. We had our own photography department. And we had, you know, uh, later on our own printing press. And, and because we also had our own uh, Gestetner uh, machines that you know published stuff when we before we got the press, so we're talking young people between 17 and 22 years old having this consciousness and understanding. I I, I, I tell a lot of quote millennials these days that. that we would consider them very old when we went on, <laughs> so, but, but 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 I just I just joke with them. I, I don't, yeah. I'm not serious about that. Yeah. I mean, you have to realize that Julian comes from a different background than most of us. Most of us were first generation college. Julian came from a family that was at the university. Julian came to, when he was young, he knew Paul Robeson and he knew, you know, uh, Du Bois and he knew everybody. So the kind of environment that Julian was raised in was a very sophisticated environment. So by the time Julian got to SNCC, dealing with people who were very smart, who uh, had a lot of, um, experiences in the world, people who had done a number of things was not a big deal to Julian. I mean, he, his father moved about through the various universities, so he was not someone who came up in a singular environment. He came up in many environments, so basically his ability to communicate with many people was probably baked into his upbringing. talk to you about is the March on Washington. Okay. And um, you were on the steering committee. Yes. And you also had a hand in, his, in John Lewis's speech. Yes. Okay. When people see that speech or mm -hmm. they watch that speech, mm -hmm. it's John Lewis's speech. Right. But it wasn't 
John Lewis's speech. He delivered the speech, but right. a lot of other hands went into that. Right. Can we talk a little bit about the hands that went into that speech and the controversy around it and, and, and what was happening in, in your end of things when that day came? All right. Well, let me say before, on the March on Washington, I had to really drag SNCC kicking and screaming and participating to participate in March on Washington. Their view was that they were doing, I mean, we were in Mississippi and Alabama at that time and Southwest Georgia, and people were doing things that were rooted in the communities. Um, the, the 1963 March in Washington seemed like a very far off event. Um, so, I mean, is it usually a SNCC uh, approach to it? is if you advocate for it fully, they said, well, you go do it. So Foreman's position was, um, you know, if you think that the March in Washington is that important, then you go represent the organization and then we will deal with gun. So, I mean, this was in the early days when, you know, no one knew, you know, but uh, as the march grew bigger and became more important, uh, SNCC became more uh, organized and involved in it. Now, in terms of the, the uh, John Lewis's speech, uh, I am sure I was not at the writing end because I was in New York, but I'm sure that you know Julian and Dorothy Zellner and, and others were involved in, and I would even say somebody like Jack Menis, mm -hmm. given some of it, was involved in. The, the construction of the speech. Uh, what happened is that the speech was sent to me maybe three or four days before the, uh, the March in Washington. And I wanted to make sure that John's speech was out there in the press and, and that people would have a chance to read it and, and see it. Um, so what happened is I made it available to the press. And what happened, we had a lot of pushback, particularly from the, uh, the Kennedy administration, and that, that pushback was expressed to the uh, Catholic Church. Now, there were a number of things that I think that was in it uh, that um, they said they had a problem with. Well, one was the criticism of the Kennedy administration as doing nothing uh, or not doing sufficient. So that I think that was the first part. I think the second part, which they, they put out there, was that John talked about we're going to march to the South. But I think one of the things that I think they objected to, but probably uh, was not really articulated, in John's speech is that, you know, one man, one vote is the African cry, it must be ours. And in 1960, that was a hell of a radical statement to talk about one man, one vote in, in the United States, given the segregation that existed in the South. I mean, I think probably uh, Jim Foreman, who was the oldest, I mean, I think Jim might have been somewhere between 32 and 35 years old. Uh, but, you know, <clears throat> had come up in Chicago, was very, you know, very knowledgeable. And one of the things we did early on, and I can't remember when, what year we did it, but I probably somewhere around 61, 62, we went to the United Nations on the question of we charge genocide, uh, picking up on some other people, some things that other people had been doing. So, I mean, my sense is that, you know, we were a fear, I mean, a number of the people in the organization were fairly sophisticated and knowledgeable about what was going on in the world. Because, I mean, I remember growing up in New York where, you know, on the street corner, people were talking about the Bandung Conference. I mean, guys I hung out with. There was a kind of level of sophistication where jazz was, you know, you had 
you know, Coltrane coming in, you had a whole bunch of things going on where you had kind of a lot of explosion going on and then you had, you know, Afro-Cuban music with Mongo Santa Maria and Willie Bobo and so forth. I mean, there was within the black community generally, there was awakening and a consciousness that included, you know, Cuba, Africa, you know, the Mau Mau with Jomo Kenyatta. I mean, that was, I mean, in the general atmosphere, it wasn't actionable in a sense that somebody said, well, we were going to do this. I mean, SNCC decided they were going to do something. That was the big difference. But in the atmosphere, there were a whole lot of various things that were going on that people had just become aware of. The other thing that you have to understand, and, and which was also important, on back to communications and television, that on you know grainy black and white television, we watched what was going on in Little Rock. In grainy black and white television, we watched what was going on in uh, in in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, in grainy black and white television and Jet Magazine, we saw what was happening with Emmett Till. So there were, uh, I mean, America. I mean, in terms of communications. America was just moving into a different world. It's almost like, you know, everything before the, the 50s or 55, you know, 60, you know, I mean, I really came into being in 60 with Kennedy using television and so forth, is that there was a great transformation from radio to television in, say, 55 to 60. Uh, and that really you made a big difference in letting us know what was going on in the world. I think I take a different view. Not that it was high board, but I think it was an important uh, point. Before 1963, every time we went on a demonstration or every time we spoke and so forth, basically we would hear the question raised, what do you Negroes want? Because that's the term that people use. What do you Negroes want? What, 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 what is all this demonstration? What are all these demonstrations about? What are, what is all this, what are the freedom rides about? What do you Negroes want? I think for white America, because, and let me also say a couple of things about the March on Washington. Uh, the Kennedy administration was terrified of the March on Washington early on, uh, and they tried to, to really to, to stop it. Uh, but when, but they had, we had already, you know, A. Philip Randolph had already not done it in 1941, and he was going to do it in 1963. Uh, and he had Bayard Rustin, who was really good about a number of things. So for white America, they kept asking the question, what do you Negroes want? I think what, why King's speech was so important and so popular was he answered that question. And the answer to the question is, we have a dream that's deeply rooted in the American dream. King's speech answered the question for white America that they had been posing. So basically, I think it was an important occasion for that, for that reason. I also think that it really kind of spelled the end to the whole discussion of the big battle being for public accommodations. And that we, particularly at SNCC, started moving in terms of voter registration and, and so forth. So my sense is that I would not say it was a, I mean, I think it answered a question. I think it was relevant and important kind of uh, event, but it, it was hardly the high mark, the high water of the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, but here, here's one of the things I've learned, and especially today's world. The narrative that never has to be associated with any facts. I mean, so, you know, you know, people have narratives and then there are facts, you know, 
So people have their narrative and they believe in the narrative. And you know, one of the things I tell my daughter, anytime somebody says, I believe, just end the discussion because it's never based on rationality or facts. I would say the Watts line. I yeah. think the Watts line was the key because you have to remember that things were coming in mm -hmm. to, to Julian. So you almost have to have a, a concept of FedEx or the way you travel these days. Mm -hmm. Everything is coming in to spoke. It's like kind of spoken wheel where you, you know things are coming in to one point and then they're going up. And I think the, um, the ability to have the watch lines uh, was probably the single most important thing that we had because we were able not only to get information to, to Atlanta, but also for Atlanta to get the information out. So, I mean, I think without the watch lines, we could have not survived. You know, this is really, it was a life and death situation. And, you know, basically the other thing that was also important was the CB radios. I mean, nobody, I mean, people kind of laugh at this point. But, you know, we, if you look at the old Snick cars, they were brown, I think, uh, they were Chryslers or something, a brown Chryslers. They had the, uh, the, the, the big thing in the back. Cause, so the ability to communicate through uh, Watts and, um, and the CB radios was particularly critical to, to what we were doing. Please. Let me also say that Julian turned out not only to be the author of the student, I mean the, the editor of the student voice and so forth, but he also probably more importantly was Snick's Griot. Um, and I mean, you really came into, I mean, he, he was the person that, I mean, he was able to express uh, both historically the, the, the whole, the, the whole SNCC uh, experience. I mean, in the ways that the griots in Africa would. I mean, he, he could do it from memory. He didn't have to recite, he didn't have to go back to books and stuff. He, he, he knew it, he could recite it to you. Um, and um, he not only knew the specifics of the history, but he also knew SNCC's attitude, the, what it meant to be in SNCC, the SNCC's attitude. So those two things were very important to SNCC. And I think we used them, I mean, I remember uh, for the, uh, when we met for the 50th in, um, in Shirali at Shaw University, he was the one that opened up the meeting by giving people the sense of their history, uh, their sense, not only, and when I'm saying, when I say the sense of their history, I don't mean just, you know, this happened on this day, this happened. On, he gave the sense of who we were and involved all the things that were done. Uh, and, and it's on, actually, it's on the SNCC Digital Gateway. Mm -hmm. It's probably, you know, one of the things. And the other thing, the other time I heard him do something that was uh, quite similar was in 1964, I mean 2014, excuse me, 2014 at the uh, 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer 64. So, I mean, so basically, because he was at the center where things came in and he was able to get those things out. I mean, the whole history of SNCC became part of his being that he could tell without any references or cards or books because they were, became, became part of his DNA. that in, after our work in 1962-63, that the state apparatus uh, of Mississippi had decided to use its, its, all its might to begin to lock us up, the, the, the SNCC people, and kill its own residents. Um, so that 
it was important and that Mississippi seemed very far. I mean, I remember hearing Roy Wilkins talk about Miss, the only thing you can do with Mississippi is make it a parking lot, pave it and make it a parking lot because there was a sense of despair that nothing could ever change in Mississippi in 1963. Uh, Bob Moses, um, in discussion with Alan Lowenstein and others, uh, talked about bringing the country to Mississippi, says so it did not become so isolated. And that when it would, the country did not mean, you know, um, you know, some poor guy who had a job somewhere and so forth. It was bringing the country meant bringing the sons and daughters of the elite to to um, to Mississippi. And um, so, what happened was that a number of people, and and again in the changing times, a number of people from Yale and Stanford and, and those other places, Harvard, you know, came to, down to Mississippi. I think what Julian and, and James did was then taking that general concept, began to amplify it by t sending the voices back home so that people, so that the connections were much deeper, be, you know, between you know, the people who were down in Mississippi and say Flint, Michigan or, or or Saginaw or some other place in Iowa. I mean, it was important. So, I mean, I think that what James and Julian uh, did in 1964 amplified the whole concept of bringing the country to Mississippi because isolated, uh, it was very destructive in terms of its own people and those of us who work there. I want to talk about his campaign in, uh, for the 65 seat, mm -hmm. not so much from your perspective there, because I know that that's not something you were in, involved in, but uh, that was a SNCC-supported yes. decision. That was Ivanhoe right. and people saying, okay, Julian, we're going to run you. Right. Less him saying, I want to do this, than yes. saying, you are going to do right. this. Is that, yes. is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that Julian was, was Julian was not the most energetic person in that kind in that regard. I mean, I think it was a big break for SNCC. Yeah. While SNCC was involved in the vote, and while SNCC was involved in the political process, it was not generally involved in the electoral process. So running Julian was a big break because you also have to remember that the first black mayor of a, a major city was like 1968. So black people in general were not involved in a lot in election. I mean, we were not really serious. So it was really a beginning of a break in terms of electoral politics. So yes, uh, Ivanhoe, who, as you know, became very much involved in the electoral world and one of the brightest people in that world, uh, really, and Ivanhoe was the person that a lot of energy, a lot of energy, and and yeah, I've heard I'm about sure. Yeah, the story of calls in this uh, <laughs> interview you did a few years back with uh, Richard Malsby, or I guess you're talking about Marion's race. Yeah. And yes. That, you know, well, the phone rang at 4 a.m. Yes. So the phone rang at 3 a.m. and it was Ivanhoe. I'm thinking, man, I would have just hung up the phone so this could wait a few hours. No, no, he, uh, no, he had a lot of energy. So you're correct. It was Julian, Charlie Cobb, and uh, Ivanhoe who were really the backbone of Julian's. I think the, the dominant thing after Julian got elected was the Vietnam War. Okay. And that was, to me, this, I mean, at that point, you, as we said, as I said earlier, a lot of us were between 17 and 22. A lot of us, you know, myself included, had one wise. That is to say, the draft board said we were not to be called except in cases of extreme national emergency. They didn't want us anywhere around. But, <laughs> but a number of people that we worked with were impacted by the Vietnam War. And when Julian tried to get, a, get uh, sworn in, 
and they refused because of the Vietnam War. That was probably the, the narrative that took over the discussion about Julian's uh, race. Um, you know, I mean, I, what, what year would that was uh, 19... 1965. 65, he was elected yeah. in 65. 65, yeah. And right before he was going to be yeah. sworn in yeah. is when the statement emerges. The statement emerges. Right. had to yeah, right. explain that. Well, we had to, I mean, and, but you also have to realize there was some, a number of things that we have to, uh, there's something else that was important. SNCC changed dramatically from 64 to 65, uh, the, SNCC, the SNCC veterans, because uh, the Atlantic City uh, experience, basically, you know, in 60, we talked about 63, you know, the question of the high mark in terms of, of, of answering the question, what the Negroes want? But in 1964, the question again of the narrative of America, you know, the question of fairness, the question of democracy, the question of all these kinds of things that if you play by the rules, you'll be able to prevail as opposed to those who pray, don't, didn't play by the rules and so forth. So in 1964, and the Atlantic City Convention, where the people from Mississippi played by the rules, listened to all of what the narrative of America was in terms of you know democracy and so forth. And then when they did all of that, and they were met by opposition because the powerful wanted to prevail, and not only the powerful wanted to prevail, but every, all of their allies, including Ruth, Walter Ruther, you know, um, Powell, I uh, would include Martin King, everybody sided with power against the things that was right and wrong. Then, then we decided that, you know, we had to look at the world differently. So, I mean, so in 1964, I'm 23 years old. And so I learned the lesson that about what America was really about in that discussion. And not myself, all of us learned the lesson. So, I mean, my sense is that we began to look at politics differently and we began to do a number of things differently. And one of them was, one, one branch was, you know, with Julian in terms of electoral politics, the other branch well, there, there are several things that happen. Electoral politics with Julian, uh, independent political organizing in Lowndes County, Alabama, and other places, and continued support of the MFDP in terms of the Democratic Party. So those three things happened in 1964, carrying on into 1965. And uh, as long as we're on the topic of Vietnam and Julian mm -hmm. Bond, right. were you involved in the drafting of the statement, the SNCC statement about Vietnam that no. Julian ultimately had to no. explain? No. Okay. No. I'm just always. Um, well, we had a number of things. I mean, a number, but I'm sure that everybody in the organization supported it. I mean, for example, Charlie Cobb, you know, told his draft board, and because as you know, SNCC was very much in, in, involved in the democratic process. We wanted to know who made that decision, why they made that decision. We, we, everybody you know, was made. So he went to the draft board and said, he's prepared to submit himself to draft if he understood who would made the decision to draft him, why they made to draft him. Um, you know, when Rap Brown went down there, he, he engaged with them in such a way that they told him that he couldn't even join the Salvation Army cause, because they didn't want him anywhere around. Uh, Willie Ricks, the same thing. So, I mean, you know, when Stokely and myself, we had the same draft board in the same day, and I told you we got a one why, we refused to answer the questions about whether we were drunks, addicts, or homosexuals. They assumed we were not drunks or addicts, but they didn't know about homosexuality, and in 1960, that was a big scare. 
uh, even today, I'm sure it is. So, I mean, they gave us, you know, all sorts of things. So we were, and while we had not made a statement as an organization, I mean, we, all of us resisted in every way that we could the, the being drafted to go to Vietnam. Reasons. Okay. Um, ones that got, I mean, I left because I got to be 27. Yeah. Um, you know, and I had to make, you know, getting 964 a week when you could wasn't going to make it. I mean, that's you know, $9.64. So after taxes. <laughs> after taxes. So that wasn't going to make it. The other thing that was different than Julian and us, Julian had five kids. Yeah. And a wife. <laughs> yes, he did. We didn't have any of that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, even though SNCC paid him a little more money, he needed to. He needed. I mean, yeah. I mean, at some point, you know, people left for a lot of reasons, and I left. I mean, the reason I when I left SNCC, I went literally from Lowndes County, mm -hmm. Alabama, to London, mm -hmm. to a meeting with Bertrand Russell and John Paul Sartre and so forth, and then I decided, well, you know. I've done, you know, I mean, I had been engaged for seven years, you know, was time for me to do other things. So the answer to why people left SNCC, I, I cannot tell you. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it was just life. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you needed to do some other things. I mean, it wasn't like you were part of, I mean, SNCC always talked about working themselves out of a job. SNCC viewed itself much more of a movement than an organization. Uh, and it was its best when it was on the movement side. And so people, people left for very many reasons, and I couldn't tell you why Julian, you know, no, no longer part of SNCC. But I do know that at his uh, memorial service, uh, Pam said, there was a question of who would be speaking and stuff, and Pam always said, you know, that Julian felt much closer to SNCC than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, SNCC, he was also the vice president of the SNCC Legacy Project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my sense is that while he let, I mean, nobody ever leaves SNCC. I mean, yeah, that, I mean you know, that at the end of the day, I mean, the only reason that the SNCC Legacy Project can exist and I, 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 did you ever get a chance to go to SNCC Digital Gateway? Oh, I, I live okay. Yeah, sure. But I'm saying the reason that we can do that is that nobody ever left SNCC. I mean, we, I mean, I can call anybody in SNCC at this point, not because, you know, of the organization or it's a, that, you know, um, I got a call yesterday, you know, a SNCC veteran died. We're trying to get his son to um, to the funeral, you know, we all have an obligation to be there. So the answer is, while people left the organization and the organization doesn't exist, nobody ever leaves SNCC. I mean, it was just, that was just it. The more we were in a combat situation, the more that is true. Okay. Um, and there is a story that Bob Moses tells where he says he met this man in Mississippi and he says, I'm part of SNCC, I'm part of CORE, I'm part of the NAACP, I'm part of SCLC. I'm part of anything that is going to change this environment for me. The other thing that is also thing is when we started going into Mississippi, they started talking about communism and we were communists and so forth. And I met this woman and she said to me, I'm sure glad you communists are here to help us. People needed, I mean, for now if you were in New York, then the, the distinctions between CORE and SCLC and so forth became you know, much more uh, pronounced. But in, when you were in that situation, when you were trying to deal with it, 
there were no big distinctions, even with SCLC. Big James Orange, who was SCLC, and all those guys, they were part of doing things and there was that camaraderie that made it clear that you know these organizations that were had these names didn't make any difference who was going to do the work made the difference so i think that's kind of you know why the the the, um, the experience is so different in a lot of places If I was a sitting in 1965, I'm, I probably am not sure. But Julian was not an unattractive person, right? No, he was not. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and Julian was also, uh, he not only was good looking, he also had a great voice. I'm very personable, very knowledgeable, as we talked about before. So that in that environment where, you know, Julian with his, now at 25, 26, you know, he now becomes uh, in this environment on the Vietnam War, which was a big issue, on civil rights, which is a big issue. I mean, I think it is not a surprise that he became a national figure because he was at the center of the two big issues of the day. And he was articulate, he was good looking, and so therefore, America, you know, brought him into national prominence. Okay. I mean, I mean, Julian was Julian. Yeah. I mean, the other thing about Julian is Julian was a very easy person. You know, he didn't have a lot of pretensions. You know, there are a lot of people who have a lot of pretensions. He was not that. He would rather tell a story, have a, you know, sit and talk to you about, you know, something that was, you know, very, not all that political stuff and you know, just very personal. And he wanted to be a comedian. He loved a good joke. I mean, he was very personal. It, I... I mean, it did not, to me, it didn't change him as a person. I mean, in terms of the way he interacted with people. I think first and foremost, as I said earlier, that Julian was the griot. He was the person that embodied the, what the SNCC, the organization, was about and was able to transmit that to, to everybody in, in all arenas. The second, he was at the center uh, he was the hub, I guess I would call it, that made the difference in communicating with the world the kind of danger that we faced as we worked in Mississippi, Alabama, and Southwest Georgia. He was, he was essential to making sure that the country knew what was going on. Um, and I guess, and third, you know, with the student voice, he was able to document and have the historical record of what was accomplished. Now, I don't think we appreciate it. And it's interesting. I now appreciate what was done by Julian much more because for us, for us, I mean, at least I don't say for us, for me. It is a big difference when you're looking from the inside out and from the outside in. For me, this is, was just my life. And it wasn't a big deal in terms of that. I was always very much surprised and shocked when young history guys or young think, academics say, well, I just did my PhD on something you did. And I would say myself, why would you do something that stupid? I didn't understand, I mean, I didn't really, it wasn't a big deal that, you know, this was history making. It was something that we did. It was important and we have more work to do. So I was focused much more on the work than the history. I think Julian was able to focus both on the work and the history. And so therefore, you know, I, I appreciate much more today that he was able to focus on both. 
uh, as, as opposed to just focusing on the work. I, mean, I would have been surprised if he didn't do it. Yeah. I mean, that you know, I mean, as to, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center, I mean, I mean, for us, I mean, SNCC, you got to realize that, again, but I said, people never left SNCC. I mean, SNCC, was a, SNCC is an idea and a, a sense of the world and a sense of fairness and a sense of, you know, that all of us should be included. Um, and so, I mean, we had, we had people who were gay in 1960 who headed up, you know, projects in Mississippi. Uh, you know, person who was a mentor, big mentor to us was Bayard Rustin. So we really, I mean, we really didn't care. It wasn't a big deal. I mean, sometimes when people, sometimes, I mean, I find like sometimes when somebody says, well, you know I'm gay and such and such, and I see, say to myself, "Well, why are you telling me that? Are you know, are you like somebody telling me they're heterosexual? I don't really care." <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't even count. I mean, for something, some of the stuff that people make a big deal, right. for us it wasn't a big deal. A big deal was we don't have one man, one vote. That's a big deal, and you know. Going back to this discussion, you know, and I tell young people all the time, and as we look at, you know, I try to summarize some of the stuff. You know, we did a lot of what was necessary, but we know it's not sufficient. And it's important for them to understand that while the World War II generation set a stage for us to let us do certain kinds of things, we set a stage for them but even the World War II generation, people set a stage for them. That, that Julian and others like Julian are part of a continuum. Uh, you know, from Julian's family and his upbringing, his father, Horace Mann, you know, uh, his father's connection to Robeson and all these people. They set the, the frame of reference for Julian early on. So, I mean, while people look at things as one-off, you know, well, this happened while he was at the NAACP. No, Julian's position was established when he was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and so my sense is just, you know, looking from the inside out, you know, Julian had no other course but to take that position. If you look from the outside in and don't see all of his life, then you're surprised that he did it. But Julian taking that position had nothing to do with the NWCP and so forth. The other thing is, you know, when we, back to the Vietnam discussion, when we took the this, this statement, I made the statement, and then King later made the statement in New York, uh, Riverside, mm -hmm. the reaction for the, the, the white establishment and some of the black people, uh, black, black leaders of these organizations, we have allowed you to speak on civil rights. You have no right to speak on any other topic. There was a mindset that you, we first of all didn't want you to speak on anything, but we've now allowed you to speak on civil rights. Now you, can, you, you now want to talk about Vietnam. You have no rights. Go back and talk about civil rights. You know, we never had that perspective. So, I mean, and I think Julia never had that perspective. And his father never had that perspective. And Du Bois never had that perspective. And, and Robeson never had that perspective. And when you look at Julian, you're looking at all those people. You may not see them, but they're inculcated in who he is. And so therefore, at the end of the day, Julian is part of a legacy that is not only Julian, but part of things that go back as far as his father and beyond that. I mean, that's the way I see it, Julian.